I'm happy to continue. Are you happy to continue? Uh, well, happy is probably going it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we are continuing. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Talking About Who, and this week we are talking about season 10. Uh, this is part one, so if you enjoy this, come back for part two. If you don't enjoy this, come back for part two. Um, like, subscribe, all the other stuff underneath, I'm very sure you know how to do that. Uh, I'm Paul Slash Ebel, and joining me today, as ever, we have got... Hello, this is James. <laughs> and hello, this is... Hang on, hello, this is Jason. Is that James? Is that really James? I thought I you were going to say you are also James. <laughs> uh, no, actually, if that's James, I definitely don't want to be James. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very rude way to start. Can I just ask, James, before we carry on, have you got a bucket? Uh, yes, I have, but I'm keeping it to the side of me. Good. No flashing your bucket throughout. Um... So we are on the 10th anniversary uh, season and story number one is an anniversary special and it is The Three Doctors. So who wants to start us on The Three Doctors? Well, this gets us off to a good start this season, doesn't it? Um, and the first of a template that's used quite a number of times actually in the future, but we're here, we're starting the 10th anniversary and I couldn't think of a better way to start the season than have all three of the Doctors brought together um, for the first time, it's fair to say, and uh, they're here to uh, save the universe because time is in peril um, from some very sinister black hole. Mm -hmm. None of the uh, pre hartnell Doctors were available <laughs> then, were they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, with the Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Soon, yeah. don't, it's not. Oh. No, you're, you're absolutely right. So we, we find the Time Lords under attack and reaching out to the Doctor to help them. And as you say, it's the first multi-Doctor story for the 10th uh, anniversary. And um, yeah, it sort of sets up a really good season of, of stories. And this, this particular one is... is it, we, we talked about the five doctors recently and the three doctors again you know ticks all those boxes you've got multi-doctors you've got um scenes on Gallifrey you've got a bit more about the doctor's sort of history um yeah it's it's we'll talk about some of the some of the elements of it such as the special effects and the, the sort of blobby creatures but um yeah it's a it's a good story um, yeah, so it is three doctors, um, one of whom is a bit old and a bit, bit, bit unable to participate and appears on screen only, sort of like Jason does with these. Um, <laughs> but it, it's lovely to see him. And I think, I think that, that's, um, it's quite, even though he is clearly, you know, he, he sort yeah. of notes, it, it, is, it is beautiful. And, and I suppose it's, it's, it's incredible now to think that's the 10th anniversary story as we sort of hurtle towards the 60th. Um, Patrick and John, obviously that's a great dynamic, I think, straight up there. It, it yeah, is, it is, yeah, absolutely a great dynamic. And when you think about it, actually, um, this comes in, in at the beginning of 1973. And in reality, Pat had only been out of the role at this stage for just over, probably just two and a half years, probably at this point. So, you know, um, it was quite recent. So for the audience watching it, um, they will have seen Pat and you know, quite likely will have seen Bill in role as well. So this isn't going to be as much of a, um, I don't know if this would have been a, as big a deal back in the mid seventies as it is for us when, when we've had multi-doctor specials in the eighties, like the five doctors, because if you think about it, uh, you know, watching there, we wouldn't have seen a lot of the old doctors in at play. But mm. it's so it's so recent after Pat. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the audience would have got it a bit uh, quite quickly. I think they would have understood it. But the chemistry between both both Pat and John. Um, absolutely amazing, isn't it? On screen, yes. But behind the scenes, 
to begin with, they didn't actually get on very well together because they're both different in their approach to things and um, sort of stories from the time of filming where that they, they clashed a bit because they were very different styles and when they came to do the five doctors that's why they don't really spend much time together but by that point they were friends in real life so once they got through this they became really good friends and they played on that uh, at conventions they played on that sort of uh, trade-off between the two of them quite a bit but um, they were apparently quite disappointed that they didn't get more scenes together in the five doctors because of the sort of experience from the three doctors Oh, I believe, they work really well. I, I believe, I mean, I'm no great expert on these situations or insider gossip. I believe that Mr. Pertwee would have a habit of writing his script out on the console because he didn't really always know all of it. And Mr. Troughton would have a habit of slightly altering some of the lines around a little bit, as long as it was sort of vaguely in the remit of what it was. So he wouldn't then give John the cue to read his line off. And there was a bit of drama over that approach, I think. Yeah. Oh, I'm shame. There's no shame. There's no studio edits of that. I would have loved to have seen all that going on. We'd have sat through all six hours of that if it was on HD, wouldn't we? Oh God, yes, <laughs> wouldn't we just have? It's all right. I've still got plenty of Paradise Towers to get through. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I think um, we don't get because I think they asked Fraser and he wasn't allowed time off yeah. Emmerdale Farm, um, but Benton sort of shifts into being. Uh, the Trouton companion in this, and is it actually a really strong story for John Levine? I think it's, yeah, because it is his strongest story. Richard Franklin wasn't available, so they they've created sort of court, the other corporal who came in to sort of play the unit soldier uh, person. So, yeah, I agree about it being one of John's strongest, actually. Um, and Nick is also on great form in this story. Um, he's a bit out of his depth because, of course. He's never really believed in all this time travel malarkey. And there he is. He's, he's, he's in some sandpit in the middle of nowhere. And he thinks he genuinely is in a sandpit in the middle of nowhere and doesn't, doesn't, still doesn't grasp it. But he plays it to perfection, um, Nick, throughout this because, um, you know, he is very much out of his comfort zone. <laughs> it's Chroma. It's, it was Chroma, yes, indeed. <laughs> But it really was a sandpit somewhere. <laughs> but the, the Kramer line was improvised. It wasn't in the original script. Which is, you know, one of those things that you remember from this, this story. The, um, the third Doctor takes the mickey out of him quite a bit as well. When he says, you know, is there anything I can help with? And he says, yeah, pass me the silicon rod. And he just stirs his tea with it. There's, there's that uh, element there that he's still you know the brigadier is is not joe and the fact that you know we go off and have adventures together he's just there he's the he's the military person well we because we did seven quite recently and we've obviously done eight before that we're now very much at the warm brigadier phase aren't yeah. we for the, for the, you know he's he's solid and he's warm and he's very wry and and it, there's no sort of side now he's just very solid and very you know um, and there's some lovely touching pieces well i think um towards the end um i mean it could just be that katie needed help across the set visually but when they go through this the the, the the smoke effect he does reach out his hand to 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 you know he doesn't describe any and that's quite sweet that he walks her through like that um so i think you have got a very sort of solid unit team feel to this one which is it, just sort of funny because you have it this and then it's gone again and then you get it for green death and then it's gone for good so it, 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 it's 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 an interesting thing um obviously we do events and stuff and a lot of people sort of talk about the unit team and we've done commentary in there and, but if you actually look at the amount of stories where you get a brigadier benton yates joe doctor it's actually quite finite there's, there's not an awful lot of them around um and obviously we don't have yates in this one but as the pro flies it, it's it's a very sort of unity story i think yeah it is a unity story, and it's it, it's great that they that they're written into this into this sort of tenth anniversary special because they have quite rightly in the previous couple of seasons played quite a strong part. And you're right, we lose them for a while, they come back, um, and obviously we'll talk about the Green Death a little bit later on in this review. But um, I was pleased that they were involved in this, and a bit and a, and unlike some of the other anniversary specials, this isn't playing too much to 
the absolute history here either. So this is standing on its own two feet, this story. It's not a, um, it's not over the top, crammed full of every Doctor Who reference you've ever seen in the first sort of 10 years. Um, there are nods, there are touches, they're delicately done. I think the boys from Bristol, Bob and Dave, they did, they, you know, they, they, they presented here realistically a very pacey script. And it's not lost in the anniversariness of it. Um, it tells its own story. It's nice and tight. It's a four part. Um, and, you know, the lead up to it and all the, the, the sort of mystery as to, you know, who's coming after the doctor, you know, and then the time Lords are having to come in and help, you know, it's got a bit of everything. For, it's got a bit of everything for everybody, um, but it isn't lost in its own hype, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense because uh, some of the anniversaries are more concerned with being an anniversary rather than being a story. And so I, I agree with you on that. It does have the function of pressing a bit of a reset button because now that you know, at the end of this story, the Doctor has regained his freedom. So you, you've got it as a springboard to the next set of adventures. So you, you, it does play a sort of pivotal role in sort of what happens with the rest of the season, with the you know, with the uh, Doctor's memory returned and the. Uh, dematerialization circuit so you you have that um but to, you know in it in and itself it's a good story um which is like you say it, it doesn't get too tangled up in you know it's been 10 years let's show every single monster we've had or let's go over different storylines it's can I, can I just interject then just say actually were you to have a story maybe that had lots of different companions in the past <laughs> lots of doctors in the past lots of monsters in the past and maybe a 3D element, that would give you possibly the greatest show. <laughs> just just I think that out there. Have thought of that. If only. If I wonder only. if you've reviewed a story that's I, similar to that. that you'll, next you'll, be selling, you'll be telling me it's set in some sort of fictional London borough. I just it had to... seven doctors. <laughs> that took some doing. And that didn't um, at all, that didn't at all revel in its glory, did it? <laughs> it was, it was just glory. <laughs> um we get we get omega for the first time we do one. yeah um, Stephen I, I, Thorne. It, great Steve, Steve, incredible again we sort of talked about monster actoring before and i mean he has got the i mean the helmet the design um Ashton, isn't it i think helmet's incredible um great look i mean he's got his disco cape on but he has got an incredible um helmet the voice is just all in power there's a lot you get a lot of pathos a lot of character through it and you know he's an incredible actor Stephen so I think yeah and I mean, different different to um Azal as well so it's a, a different performance yes yeah, exactly what I was going to say mm. it's it is a, obviously a complete contrast to his earlier appearance and uh, strangely he appears one more, he appears again a little bit later on in the season um almost in a blink and you'll miss it but you no know, he he commands the part and you know the mask is always a challenge for any actor, particularly the, um, the Omega mask, um, because there isn't anything facial in there. And obviously for good reason, because when she takes the helmet off, there's nothing there, but um, there isn't anything facial. So it's got to be the commanding presence. And, you know, he was great at doing those roles where you just don't see his face. And um, yeah, brilliant actor and well-suited. And I think brought um, the part of Omega um, quite to life um, through this story. I mean, his performance is so good that when he actually takes the mask off, I was genuinely, you know, I remember watching this first time around, genuinely shocked there was no one in it. You know, the, the, you, you couldn't see anything because his, his performance... You know, that, was a, that was a visual effect, you know? I know. <laughs> yeah. just, just, in, just in the way you get that sort of genuine shock that... Do you never do that when you see someone in a mask and you imagine what they look like? Uh, no, I've never done that yeah. at all, ever. No, it's just me then. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine what someone looks like if you can just hear their voice, you imagine what they would look like, but then he takes, you know, never mind. I'll shut up. You know, you know he was there and it was just like a, a yeah. blue Thanks. screen effect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How old were you when you first watched this one, James, just out of interest? 43. <laughs> Well, you watched it in the original run then in 1972. Oh, you? Oh, <laughs> shots have been fired. Oh, are you throwing age shade at me? All <laughs> over it. All over it. 
Oh, I remember that watching this story, first of all, actually. I'm going to give it away. I always do a little age-related story. As, as Stato does his stats, I'll do my age-related one. So that I first saw this story uh, as part of the Five Faces season back in 1981. Um, uh, just, you know, and... Yes, this was great because you didn't get old Doctor Who stories. I think I've said this a number of times, you know, and we'd had an unearthly child and I'd sat through the cave of skulls there and we'd had the crotons and I was super excited. And then we got to three doctors and it was just like, oh, that really is a glorious, glorious story. And it's one that really has stuck with me, I think, through through my years in uh, as being a Doctor Who fan. Um, I think Lenny Main gets uh, gets a really good story here. Gets a pacey script from the Bristol Boys. And I think he executes it well. It's a nice mix of studio. There's a nice mix of location, a bit of action. Um, he's let down a little bit just by one or two of the costumes. Um, and I won't, which, which costumes? I won't mention. I won't mention Gel guards at all here. <gasps> oh, I love the Gel guards. No, I love them. Are we not calling them Gel guards? Gel guards. Gel guards. I would call them Gel guards. Are we gelling or galling? Well, they're bloody awful anyway, so um, they, they really don't look great out on location, do they? I mean, I, I love the sound effect that just goes... Whoop. <laughs> they, just, <laughs> <it's great. laughs> hey, look, they, they are so 1970s. You couldn't even... If you wanted to make a 1970s monster, you couldn't make a more 1970s monster. It just, it's just that kind of disco. It that, is. And the bouncy eye. I love the bouncy eye yeah. as well. You and can the, and see then the feet at the bottom of them, and they're shuffling along. <laughs> when they get, but what I love well, is feet. Yeah. <laughs> when they get to the, the the anti, you know, to to Omega's realm, all of the walls are like that as well. You know, the sort of bubble effect. I really like that design. But yeah, I yeah. Don't Omega really loves like... his bubble mat, bubble wrap, doesn't he? It does. I don't mind the bubble effect sets. I think the sets are really, really good in this. I've got to be honest. Um, I, I just don't know. They've just never really sat that well with me. I had them on the... Was it the Weetabix? They've just card? never gelled. Is that what yeah. it is? Oh, whoa, you're on it. Oh. Um, was it the Weetabix cards that had yeah. the, the gel guards on? I've seen in history books, but yes, I think it was the the, the on the Weetabix. And, and you could get little character options toy set as well. Yes. Oh, whoa, can you really? Well, you could, yeah. And it actually looked like the, the, the thing that was seen on screen. Um, <laughs> uh, also, big shout, I have to do a big shout out on this one, for, for, for Laurie Webb, who is an actual oh. legend, complete legend. Mm. Mr. Um, Ollis himself. Mr. Ollis himself. Mr. Ollis. Uh, who we had the pleasure of showing it to for the first time in 40 odd years, and it was just magical. Um, a man who, I mean, literally sort of Second World War hero, and he was sat there talking about being in the clay pit for Doctor Who. And, and, <laughs> Bizarre situation. Um, yeah. That was another another character spin-off we should have had, Mr. and Mrs. Ollis. The, the oh, Ollis's, it, it, yeah. it should have been the, they should have been the neighbours for, for um the spearhead couple. They should have been the next <laughs> next sort of field down, shouldn't the they? The Seelies. Next the door Seelies. to the Seelies. <laughs> it have been Doctor Who's Terry and Jew. Mrs. Farrell. Oh, oh, Mrs. Farrell. Actually, yeah. you've almost got a Coronation Street set up going on here. Imagine all this lot in Coronation Street. That would be amazing. That'd be great. The master could come in for a couple of episodes to stir it up and have an affair and then go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The master would be like Richard Hillman of Coronation Street and drive Gail into the lake. <laughs> <bumping them all. laughs> when, when Mrs. Ollis asks for too much money on the season break, they're like, well, oh, bring the master in, he'll get rid of her. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's not too late. There's always a vocal impersonators. Yeah, there are indeed. And uh, we mustn't forget as well, of course, the brand new TARDIS, TARDIS set. set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's harking so much, harking back to the original 1963 um, Brahaki set, isn't it? It's, it's a nice, I like the little telly they've got. I like, I like the, the, the telly monitor. Very, mm -hmm. very tech. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Katie does well with, I was going to say Katie does well with two doctors, but it doesn't sound quite as, <laughs> as well as I'd like it to sound. Um, but it's interesting because there isn't really a waiver with Joe, is it, that she, she, she doesn't, she does, she, there's no danger that she's going to be sort of second doctor's assistant in this situation. No, not at all. Um, and I mean, John and Katie were so on point by this yeah. stage as well, a couple of years in now. And really, you know, they, they are so good together 
on screen. And that's right the way throughout this season. There, there isn't a duff story as far as that sort of doctor companion relationship goes, I think, in, in, in this season. No, no, I do agree. <laughs> You left me hanging there. I love it. I just, it's always good to just give you that moment of uncertainty, I think. Just, 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 just if you worry. Um, I'm not sure I have too many um, more prescient points to make on the three doctors, actually. Has Sato got any exciting no, facts? We've, we've, got, no, we've, we've covered um, everything that I was going to, uh, to talk about. Okay. I'm just going to yeah. throw in one more um, for me, as I always do at the very end. The target cover for this story was so epic. And, you know, I was almost disappointed when I saw it in the Five Faces season that there wasn't big thunderbolts coming out of his hands like this. So target cover, love it. Isn't that a mar is it, it's a ripoff of a Marvel It is, cover. you're quite right. Yes, it is a ripoff. A homage. Into, no, not a, a homage. Ripoff, no, that's harsh. A homage, absolutely a homage. That's that's much better. And, and also, um, I think there's at least one of us on this call who's got a mint condition hardback with that very cover image, not X Library. I wonder who that could be. It certainly isn't me. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna sell it on Monday and buy a facelift. This is um, all I've got to say about that. <laughs> Oh. What's Marmite about a hardback? You mad old Marmite that I haven't got it. I don't like it and I don't have it. Well, I don't know. £600? It's yours. <gasps> You'll be flooded with offers on the chat. That's a, dis that's a discount rate for you, Jason. You, you've priced it up already, haven't you? It's probably worth a little less than that. 50 quid. No, it's yes. We won't get onto, we won't get onto the cost of hardbacks right now. They are ridiculously priced though at the moment. I've got to be honest. Well, but, uh, yeah. One of my favourite, one of my favourite of the Target novels is the Three Doctors. So, are we going to do scores on the doors then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's go to um, let's go to the King of the Rubber Glove here and see what he wants to um, give the Three Doctors. <laughs> Uh, I really love this story and um, I really enjoyed watching it back. It's, it's one of those go-to stories, uh, which is just, it's not, as Jason said, it's not sort of too wrapped up in the history of the show for, for an anniversary story. And so I gave this a very hearty nine. Well, gosh. Mm. Okay. Jason looks shocked. I don't know whether he's just switched the cam on or... <laughs> no, I to be honest, there are some things the eyes will never unsee. And um, this this cosplay this week is one of those, I've got to say. You've excelled yourself, but it's 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 taking a bit of getting used to. There's, um, a, there's a film where Peggy mounts at a char lady, and it's sort of reminding me of that. I I got a little bit of a Peggy from Heidi High vibe off it myself. It's such a versatile wig. You do very <laughs> versatile wigging. Not the same wig you had for that season 24 review, was it? No, this is this is another one. <laughs> Not dipped white. <laughs> Bleach the ginger locks. <laughs> anyway, Jason, what okay. are you thinking score-wise for Doctor Who and the Three Doctors? Doctor Who and the Three Doctors. Um, a great start to season 10. Um, everything a Doctor Who fan would actually want here. Um, you've got the Time Lords, a villainous Time Lord, a black hole, which is always a favourite of everyone. Um, you've got the entire unit building being lifted up and whizzed through space like Dorothy's house out of the Wizard of Oz. What more do you want? It's a fabulous story. Lenny Main does a great job on it. And um, we've got our classic line of a dandy and a clown that comes out of it. For me, a very, very solid start to the season. And it's a solid eight. Mm -hmm. Tense moments, tense moments at, at Phantom HQ here. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably <laughs> I'm going to be a little, a little bit contrary here. Um, mainly just because, because you know, what well, what would it be if I didn't have some hate each week? Um, I do like the Three Doctors, um, but for me, I think it's sort of a good story, and I don't think it's an amazing story. It's okay. 
I like it. I like I like a lot of things about it, but I you know I'm not sure it's an outstanding one for me. So, um, with that in mind, I scored the three doctors seven. That's all right. I thought that was going to go much. I thought you were going to say five. Then, and then I was going to. Oh, it's not, it's not the Genesis three. of the Daleks. Come on. <laughs> It's not season 18, folks. Um, <laughs> too soon? Too soon? Um, so that um, gives the three doctors a combined total of 24. Mm. Solid start. Sorry. It's a solid start. Um, and we move on now to story number two, which is Carnival of Monsters, which obviously before Stato even, even reaches for his pad, it's the first one recorded. Yes. <laughs> Excited by that pre-revelation. Um, so we're a bit on Doctor in the miniscope. Oh, you still you fly, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not the green death yet. I can't talk about my fly. <laughs> you know, so you know, like when when a when a cat sees something like a you know a moth or so a fly, it's just like this watching it. No, there was a helicopter going over the house and it was disturbing me, so I had to put myself on mute. It could have been a unit helicopter. I'm ho I, in my dream it is. Benton will be there in a second. I'll whisk him away. Anyway. Like the milk tray, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so, Doctor Who and the Miniscope. Yes. So, we're off to Metabilis 3. Or not. <laughs> Jason's gone to Metabilis 3 as we speak. <laughs> I'm back from Metabilis 3. <laughs> That was quick. Um, so, yeah, the, at the end of the last story, there was supposed to be a feeding line saying, you know, let's go to Metabilis Free, but it was cut out of the story, but it was reintroduced into the novel. Um, and that's kind of a theme going through the rest of this season is the fact that the Doctor keeps going on about going to Metabilis Free, never quite makes it until later on. Um, so instead, ends up in the miniscope um, on the SS Benice where all is not what it seems. Uh, and we get our first glimpse of, um, of Ian Martin, um, Martyrs, who would later go on to, to be Harry. Oralise them. Mm. <laughs> and, okay. I'm holding back. Do you want me to continue? Oh, on? no, 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 okay. Yes. Um, uh, there, there are, there's... Um, a lot of lot of semen action for Jason in this one. He always gets excited by <laughs> a sailor. Oh, there's nothing wrong with a sailor, and uh, that's exactly what we get in this one. And it, it, James is quite right. It's all is not what it seems when we're on the uh, SS Bernice. And um, it's interesting when you get these stories where the, you start off on a premise and you think it's going down a certain way, and then it starts to it starts to uh, unfold and go down a different way. Um, for me, um, Carnival of Monsters is. Um, Actually, for me, it's the oddity of this season. Um, it's great that we're back in space. It's great that we've, we've traveled in the TARDIS and, you know, the Doctor's free you now to roam wherever he wants. And he ends up in this sort of mini scope, um, in this, trapped in this little, this little sort of carnival of monsters as it, as it is. And you'd be forgiven for thinking you were back on Earth almost immediately. But then mm -hmm. you, you get the sort of spaceport and you get the sort of, you know, the coming off and setting up the mini scope and this is very much a 70s story if you talk about the gel guards being 70s in their design then this is super 70s in its design this this story because you know james Aitchison's really really let loose again on these costumes with the sort of see-through bowler hat and and everything else um not a favorite of mine of the season I, I i will be totally honest um i think there's some great there's some great supporting cast in this and i think it's a it's a good enough story but following on from the three doctors, I think this is definitely a step a step down from where we were at the start of the season. I'd, I'd never like it be, to be said that I just instantly disagree with anything that Jason says. I would say the Carnival Monsters is a step up from the three doctors. It's, it's quite a release that now we're back out, we're back out and it's a travel. And I, there's lots of lovely little things of the, the fact that they think that they've landed on, a, on, a, on the ship. Katie's favourite Doctor Who moment ever, ever, ever talking to the chickens. 
She does the voice for the chickens. She, she does she? the chickens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's her 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 Doctor Who crowning glory. Honestly, I haven't said that she said that. Um, and I, there's oh, there's lots of like I love there's there's lovely little bits of satire. Robert Holmes when he want, when he does the satire, I think he does that really well. And there's lots of that on the with the, the um, Peter Halliday and Michael Wisher and Terence. Lodge. That that's. Mm. Barry's directing, so you have Terence Lodge, it's sort of like it's obligatory. Um, uh, Cheryl Hall, and I, I like the, the traveling, so the sort of circus thing as well. That's really good, and they've got a good alien look, and, and oh, lots of lovely, nice setups. And it's obviously slightly, I don't know whether it's inspired in the grand scheme of things from the upset of the circus recording in Terror of the Autons, mm -hmm. whether that's something that Barry carried through as a Let's do something about this as a story. Um, the morality got, of keeping things, you know. Um, just, there's lots, there's really lots to like of this, and then it, and it goes around at a fair pace. And Leslie Dwyer, to be fair, as Borg, he really does steal everything. He's brilliant. In. He's absolutely brilliant. Mm. He is. I, I, and this is why I sort of held back because I'm interested to see what both of you think before I come in, and and and. And actually, I like all the bits in the mini scope. I like the idea that they go from one sort of area to another. They've got the, you know, the drashigs. You, uh, it's the um, only time a Cyberman is seen in Pertwee's run. I know he comes across them again in the Five Doctors, but it's the only time that uh, Cyberman appears. Um, so I like all of that. And I like the fact that they're trying to work out where they are and they're trying to escape from it. For me, the weakest part of this story is the stuff that goes on outside of the scope. I, I don't like the political thing where they're trying to overthrow President Zarb. I, I just, the, and you talk about the costumes and you're right, sort of like Vorg's costume and his assistants are all funky and very 70s and they are grey. Uh, you know, and in one shot, you can even, the, the skull cap is not even on properly. It, it just... And, and I don't know. That's probably deliberate. But oh no, because because no, Barry got uh, talking about the, the thing he wanted. He had that cut, didn't he, from the repeat yeah. that Mason saw as a twenty-year-old. <laughs> I beg your pardon. No, I think it was in 1981 yet again. I saw this for the first time when that's I was eleven. Li that's literally what I just said. You were twenty. Eleven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's no, and, and I know that, that they had to add more to it because it wasn't really a sense of. You know, in danger or story other than them trying to get out of the 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 mini scope so they've got this subplot about you know um trying to overthrow the, the president and trying to take control uh by releasing the drash eggs and causing lots of of chaos and, and i get that i just for me i mean the, the there's a bit of repetition where they keep going through the ss Benice again you know, and the, you know, even to the point where sort of, you know, Joe's going, oh, I know the drill and, you know, they know where to hide so they avoid everybody. And, and then when the drashics come in, that sort of mixes everything up because you've got the same thing, but now you've got the characters all acting out of, of um, out of their own sort of little bubble. And I really enjoyed that. I like, I like the fact that the drashig moves into different sides. And I, and I almost wish we'd seen more of that where there was different scenarios that their presence in the miniscope was disturbing. But it's, um, it's the same when you get these, this, this thing in a story where you've got this sort of looping thing. We've seen it a few times. It's used, mm. it's used to great effect a number of times through, through Doctor Who, but it, it can get a little bit monotonous and a bit repetitive. And then, then it, it does break out. You're quite right, it does break out, but you've got to sit through, it almost feels like you've got to sit through it a couple of times before it starts to, before well, it starts you, to you'd do have that. to sit through a couple of times otherwise you wouldn't have known it was looping would you <laughs> yeah. but it's it's kind of it's a great filler for episode isn't it <laughs> uh, it's yes and no i mean it's, it's not i don't think it's it's looped that much within the narrative i think i think you get certainly different take takes on the on on the setups you know different angles coming in at different um perspectives and slight variants where they try to buck the um change i mean i think that the, the notion of having lots of different showing lots of different setups within the miniscope the point i would sort of say is that the, the major and claire are your sort of human contacts and you've got to be worried mm -hmm. about them 
in their predicament because um, they're oblivious to, to any of the dangers and, and you've got to be worried that something's going to happen to them. And um, it's quite, it's, it's, it's actually a very subtle sort of subplot. I mean, because Claire and um, Ian Mark, there's a hint that he fancies her, but she's just, just having a bit of yeah. a flirt because it's a cruise kind of thing, it's, you know. Um, that's really subtle and you don't get the payoff to that till literally the last scene of the show. Um, so that's, I do like that. And it's nice human. And then obviously then you have to break up with a go to the, the, sort of the, the bogs, as it were, for the Drashigs. And the Drashigs look incredible. You know, that, yeah. they're really well realised. Um, but the political thing outside, I mean, it's incredible. It's the, the watching, I thought there's so many analogies to, to the things that we all uh, campaign against and are worried about now. That when, when um, Borg, is that Peter how they Borg? He's like, it's unclean. It's come out of the machine. It's a foreigner. It's alien. It's yeah. unclean. It's like crikey. This is this 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 is such a, a kind of like they, they want to eradicate the the creatures and the thing because they think they're they're different. They think they're alien. They think they're they're going to be dirty and contagious. And sort of, I thought that was that was very clever. And I thought there were lots of sort of analogies to take from that. Yeah, I, I, nodding. I, I, they're nodding now. No, they're like they're like you're right, Ballard. You're right. I, Carnival is the highlight of the season. <laughs> It's all right. I mean, I, I don't mind. I don't mind just changing your opinions on these things. I'm, I'm not I'm a huge. Certainly I'm, not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. A, I, I've got to be honest. I'm not a huge fan when politics comes into the series because I don't think it needs it. Oh, well, it's. I, um, you say that, but surely it's. It's just. It's not like it's saying this is your standpoint. This is what you should believe. It's, it's quite a clever part of the narrative. It's not. It's not a preaching story, is it? No, no, it's not. not, not it's, at all, no. no, it's not. And there's lots of politics in, in it's certainly in Pertwee's era, you know, and we'll probably talk about more of that as we as we go through. I, I just, for me, as a watcher, as a, you know, as someone enjoying the show, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of the miniscope and a little bit less of that side of things. The political stuff aside, yes, there's a, you know, there's a point to that. But here was an opportunity to, you know, have an adventure which is unlike any other because it's in its own little um, universe, if you like, because it's in the miniscope. But then you, you would only have just been doing little bits of... So if they'd have gone into the, the land of the Cybermen walking around mm. whatever the Cybermen were doing in there, it wouldn't have... I don't think it would have helped the structure. But, I mean... I take what you say, but I, you I'm could have sure. an entire season set inside the mini scope and have a di go into the different worlds and throughout the mini scope, every every story, or just have a, a very tight four part story and leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sag in the middle like many six parts do. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe, maybe that's the way forward. Um, uh, the drashigs, I, I agree with you about the drashigs, by the way, very well realised, very, yeah. very well realised. And it's a great set piece, you know, as we as we lead towards the, the cliffhanger to episode two and that they're seen again a few times. Um, brilliant. But again, just my own feeling on this. Great visual. But then thereafter, whilst they're moving around inside the scope, Again, could have just been. I just don't. I don't know that um, they they are realised as well in other episodes as they are in that in that cliffhanger in particular at the end of episode two. Oh, you're leaving me right hanging here on this one, aren't you? I don't. <laughs> Also, I mean, it should be noted you can also get a character option trash it with like a ham puppet. <gasps> yeah, hours of fun. You can get them. Hours of fun. Um, I'm not sure I've got too much left to say on the card. Uh, just, uh, I'll oh, add we've got that, facts. Um, we've got facts. No, 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 we're just going to say that no. Cheryl Hall and uh, Jenny McCracken originally were in the frame to play Joe. So they, they originally were, were auditioned for, for that role, but uh, didn't get it. So came along, came along here I and the filming think. was interrupted. Uh, for a bomb scare, which turned out to be an alarm clock of, on in an assistance bag. Wow! Well, you really have a for these stats this week, haven't you? I've got to be honest. No. Um, was it? Yeah, I thought we were going to get the story about Mr. Pertwee borrowing something from the, the ship on location. It being noticed that he borrowed it and being asked to return it. <laughs> 
I, I thought all of a sudden you were going to come up with a stat there that was saying that in actual fact, one of the mini scope areas was going to have quarks in it at one point. Oh, I was waiting for that. Oh, Jason. Bless you. My one mention. My one mention. Bless him. Um, <laughs> so, I think, also, I suppose it's quite nice not that the Ogron has a thing in it, so they come back yeah. later. Anyway. Doctor Who and the Carnival of Monsters. Where are we at scores on this then, gentlemen? Let's go to Jason first for the mean score. And I'm afraid it probably is going to feel a little mean. So, um, uh, be honest, this story is it's 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 not uh, it's not a classic by any stretch. But it's not the worst story either. Um, it's a story of two halves. You get the bits as as James has said a couple of times in the mini scope get bits out of the mini scope, certain amount of political sort of feel to the story about the overthrowing and, and you know, yes, let's, okay, let's down the force field so the Drashics will bash the place up and all that sort of thing. But I'm left wanting a little bit on this story and um, everyone is going gonna, is gonna to have a different view to this. It's not, <laughs> oh, they're off again. It's not, it, you know, it, it it is a Marmite story for me, I, I will say that. Um, and I know it isn't probably for a lot of other people, but it is for me. And I'm falling down on the side of not really um, saying that it would be a go-to story for me to watch um, if I was having a season uh, a season 10 rewatch. So uh, with all that in mind, not the worst, not the best. And uh, I'm going to go in with a very, a very uh, middle of the road six. <laughs> oh, it might be no, this is uh, Peters is going to hate, and I'm now having that. I'm now in the point where I'm sure lots of people will disagree with it, but you know, I put my marmite up, and that's my caveat for this one. James, may a, may a drashig eat you in the night. Um, it's, it's had um, worse eating him in the night, let's be honest. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. age. So, um, it, the thing I have here is that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a nice enough story, but it's in a season which has got some um, brilliant stories. So when you watch it together, it, it does feel, for me, and I know, I know you're going to disagree with this, but I, I feel it is a step down from the three Doctors, but, but not a massive step down. In, in the fact that if this had come in season 18, it probably would be our winner. So, you know, it, it's, it's... You've set the bar quite high there. Um, <laughs> you know, so I have to look at it in, in, in all fairness as a, as a standalone story, not in, in amongst all the other, you know, potentially higher scoring stories. So I, I'm, I'm not as stingy as Jason, ever. So uh, I gave it a seven. Seven. Um, yeah. I don't dislike it. That's what I mean. It, it's, it, it, there are bits that I enjoy more than other bits, but it, overall, it, 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 it's a nice story. I think Carnival of Monsters is bright. I think it's vibrant. I think it's fun. I think it's entertaining. I think it's got great strands, great performances. I do think it is a lot better. I mean, not like, like, a, like a galaxy better than the mm. Three Doctors, but I think the better is a better story. I would go to it over the Three Doctors. So Jason just has one breaking through his window. He has a noise then. Um, <laughs> it's the unit helicopter. Has he finally kicked through the window? Yeah, I'm, I, they're all kicking off here, I think. <laughs> Wales, it's rough, darling. I know, um, lovely. <laughs> It's not really. Some parts no, it's very lovely. nice. It, no, it is lovely. Uh, Wales is lovely. I, I'm, as you know, a big fan of Wales. Well, it's a bit too late if you are now, isn't it? I suppose um, it is, really. <laughs> um, so, Carl says, yes, I think um, it's not my favourite this season, but it's very close to being my favourite this season, and I have given it eight. There we go. That's a very, yeah. very, very good score. Hmm. It is. It's better than you two mean old queens have given it, which um, leaves Carnival of Monsters on 21 points. But we are sticking in space and heading to the frontier in space. 
or even Ooh. Doctor Who and the Space War, um, which of course the Target novel is uh, aptly named. War between Earth and Draconia seems inevitable, unless the Doctor and Joe can get to the bottom of the rising tensions. And there is quite obviously some masterful planning going on behind the scenes. Oh, Do you know what? This the is puns are out, aren't they? We, we, we watched a show the other day where, where Lee from Steps, he spoke in a very similar manner to Jason. It was chilling. Oh, no. Are you referring to me as Lee from Steps now? Well, he got a similar sort of script. Well, you know, you've got, to, you've got to prepare a little for these things. You know, it's, you know, I love it to be spontaneous. And it is spontaneous thereafter because I really don't have a script for the rest of this stuff. Uh, this is um, a, a good, again, it's a very good story. Um, Frontier in Space... Um, has some very lofty ambitions. Um, you've got the fabulous Draconians, um, very, very well realised. And this season, you know, the monsters are coming out, they're coming out well realised throughout, I have to be honest. Um, obviously, it's very, uh, it's very sadly Roger's um, last appearance in Doctor Who as the master, which is obviously something that we were... Um, you know, he was very well missed um, and not being in the rest of the season and not being in the rest of the story and obviously what was planned for the for potentially Pertwee's last story. So, you know, we were certainly robbed of, I think, one of the, well, the best master um, at that stage. However, going back to the story, um, it's, 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 again, it's quite political, uh, this one. Um, but it's, for me, uh, one of those stories that... Um, is probably a little over long at six parts. Again, I, I, I will always say, you know, we weren't watching it in that way back in the 70s. You'd be watching it as single episodes, but there's an awful lot of getting locked up here and there's an awful lot of getting mm. uh, escaping and then there's an awful lot of getting locked up again. But having said that, good story, some excellent uh, visuals, some, some model visuals. So, you know, yeah, it's, it, it continues what I think is, is a great season. Yeah, I, I'm vaguely intrigued because you didn't like the political parts the political of Carnival stories. and Monsters, which is sort of quite slight and around the rest of the stories. This is pretty much full on political. It's Malcolm Hulk. It is pretty much full on a political thing. It is. Yes, indeed. And again, I can I can like different stories for different reasons. Um, I'm not saying that I'm loving Frontier in Space because of the political elements of it. There are lots more elements of this story that I that I like. I love the the, the, um, the draconians. I love that sort of edge. That that whole sort of we don't know who's attacking who. Um, you've got the sort of doctor in the in the prison, or, or, you know, the penal colony. You've got the lead up towards the end. There is lots of stuff going on in this story. Um, there, where the political stuff for me can travel along and it not be as obtrusive for me personally uh, as I felt it may well have been in the Carnival <laughs> Monsters. However, um, I'm not saying- Who's attacking whom? The politics of Draconia and Earth? I am not saying any, I am not <laughs> saying that this story is, you know, again, top of my tree. I'm not gonna be giving this a 10 here, but I will say that I do like this story um, for um, the Draconian, the Draconians in particular. I think they're great costumes. Wow, <laughs> that was that was a lot of backpedaling there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the back pedal, I, I think you covered it with a costume. I think I've I think I've said I've gone to Dra Draconia and come back to Earth. Um, I mean, I've escaped several times during that uh, during that backpedal. I, I think. <laughs> I mean, this this is essentially the start of really an, an epic twelve parts. I know that they're, they're, they're separated and in two different stories, but they're the start of a, a twelve episode story arc. And, and what I love about this is is it is epic in its scale and its ambition. You know, you've you've got um, the fact that they are captured and then you know they go to Earth and then they're not believed and then they get captured and then they go to Draconia and then they're not believed and then they get captured and you do have the these sort of these these bits and we, you know, we might talk about how many episodes long this story is but there's a lot going on that although it's a little bit repetitive for me and this is going to be a thread through the, the next couple of stories is I I love Joe's character and I, I love Joe's development as as we come through her final stories and this is one where 
you you really start to see it. So a bit later on in the episode, I'm skipping to the end because it's it's one of my favourite scenes when the master tries to hypnotise her and is not able to. And then he tries to use his, you know, um, sonic hypnosis and that fails. And actually the way that he ends up tricking her is relying on her resourcefulness. You know, he relies on her being able to escape from a prison, get past the guards and send the doctor a message. And I, and I if you think back to Joe when she first arrived, when she was first hypnotised by the master to deliver the bomb to unit headquarters. And there's a, there are lots of different um, callbacks, if you like, to, to early Joe stories. This is one. There are, there's another one I specifically want to talk about later on, where you see that parallel where she is stronger. She, you know, she spends quite a lot of time in this story and the next on her own you know, with the master or with the fowls or, you know, she, she's got her own mission. She knows what she wants to do. She wants to save the doctor. She wants to try and, you know, sort everything out. And, and I, I love that. I, I love the fact that she, you know, he goes off, he's in the penal colony and he's got his own little story. She's, you know, off with the master and he's, you know, she stands up to him. And I, and I, I really like that. I, I really like that the fact that that you know they've got to the point where they can they can do that and it doesn't feel like you're um what's the word it doesn't feel like you're losing out on anything because they've separated them and they've got their own little stories to to follow and i think although it is six episodes and you could say well do we really need all the two you know from one prison to another prison the fact that they have their own separate stories within that i think um does warrant a little bit more time that's just that's just me. I agree with the, the, everything you said about the Joe um, situation. There's lots of lovely interplay with Joe, um, Katie, and Roger. There's there's a chemistry yeah. there, and, and and the bit where she does her monologue is like, "Well done, Miss Grant. We'll let you know." And things yeah. like I, 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 there's lots of lovely bits like that. Um, slightly more dubious when she when she uses a, a tablespoon to dig her way out, of the, her way. The, out of the cage. <laughs> I mean. She'd have, even if it was very good soil, she'd have had to have a good old dig at that, wouldn't she? Um, that's a scene they didn't show, isn't it? Um, I think the thing that upsets me slightly about the frontier, the, the frontier in space being so long, is that it's it's six episodes and you have a lot of very sort of slow uh, escape, capture escape. Then the last two minutes, it's it's, it's like what happened? It's it's, it's it's kind of like there's like you've got a big space war brewing. So, so the Earth people go, we'll go and tell everyone that, that it's not their fault. And then the Craig go, we'll go and tell them it's not their fault. And um, we're done. It's like, so hang on, we've had five episodes of you not trusting each other and you don't agree with it. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, just, we'll just tell them it's not the Draconians' fault. <laughs> and it's a bit, and I know there was a problem um, recording wise because they had to do the remount with David Maloney for, for the, the bit where the Doctor's Dragon is the TARDIS. Um, but it, does feel a bit kind of like oh you 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 you've had so long to build up for a for a proper ending and resolve it all and and I think the biggest cheat and I suppose the biggest upset is Rod Roger I mean they couldn't have known what was going to happen mm. nobody could know but the fact that he's he, the master even within the narrative of the story suddenly just just, just sneaks off at the end run off with yeah. the Ogrons or something like it, it it doesn't doesn't scam. Um, because you're almost sort of expecting him to turn up essentially then in the next story, because obviously this is the lead into the next story um, from a point of view of people have perceived this to be a big 12 parter. Um, it's not, it's two separate stories we know, but um, so you could be mistaken for thinking that that ending, you know, doesn't need to pay off because it will pay off in the, in the next story potentially when, you know, we pick up the narrative with the Daleks Um it is a very rushed, very, very rushed ending, I would agree. Um, it's strangely, though, the episode six is one of the episodes that I'm most familiar with um, because it's on the perch for years. And so for years, I saw episode six, you know, before I saw the sort of five that came before it. And it's one of those weird things that certain episodes you can sort of watch individually and, and pick up the story you know, you kind of know exactly what the situation is there without having the five episodes before. 
Um, so for me, it's always very sort of, you know, entwined with that video release, strangely. I mean, there's some great, there's some great moments when they're all three of them are prisoners. I mean, they they all take their turns in sort of ending up being captured by someone. And I, and it, it, there is such a lovely sort of relationship between Delgado and, and Pertwee, and they they always spark off each other. They're you know they're, it's such great comedy timing as well. You know when they're in they're in the cell and. You know, he's winding him up and he just rolls over and goes, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to have a kip now. And, you know, he's got the homing beacon there. And he's, you know, even when he's like doing that, he looks really smug because he thinks he's got one over. And the, uh, when they arrive and um, they're both trying to persuade the draconian uh, leader that their, you know, their version of the story is true. It's, it, it, I, I love those scenes. And, and that's probably the saddest thing about this story is because that's the last that you see of Delgado and, and I would have loved to have seen like you say either in the next story or you know a few stories down the line where he reappears you know this plan having gone wrong the Daleks chasing him and him having to come to the doctor for help with some scheme you know that kind of thing I think you know would have been so so nice um, it just you know fate unfortunately intervened and it is a bit of a weird ending for him that he just scuttles off you know he's like oh it's all gone tits up and, and just runs off and that that's it which is quite quite sad mm -hmm. um also i know jason doesn't like physical parts of doctor who um, <laughs> it's, 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 the inference is there isn't it that that um, life on Earth is actually probably a, a, a bit more um, difficult, I suppose, because anyone that's for the peace party or is political or has a view contrary to the mm. government's beliefs is sent to a penal colony. So you can't argue. So it's sort of a dictatorship. So as much as um, the lovely Vera Fusek um, comes across as being a, a, a lovely president of Earth, the inference is that actually life on Earth is probably not great. And there's... I think I like all of the bits they have with the news footages, uh, footages, news footage yeah. and things like that. I think that's quite a nice touch. Um, as an aside, if anyone has heard of Planet Scara, who do their own audios, I played the president of Earth first for their audio. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. I, I did. Um, I, I don't think they quite, because I think they thought I was going to play a bit. Spray, and I did it as a French hermaphrodite. So... Um, it's out there. It's it's a good listen. I think there's there's a. I like the moment where the the general admits that he opened fire on the sort of draconian ship, and you've got you've the reason why the master's plan is working is because there's simmering tensions already, and there's there is a fear that war could break out any time, and so you have that moment where he is. The, He's quite, um, you know, with the president, he sees the president as weak and, and is, is very much like, you know, we'll take over, we'll have a military coup, no one's supporting you. And, and she um, finds herself backed into this corner. And then suddenly the, the tables turn and he says, actually, that was my fault. We, we fired on this draconian ship. That's what started some of the, some of the problems. So you, you have all of that going on and, and, I, that I I do like that. I like that backstory that that's happening between you know the the two parties because that explains why the master's allow you know getting away with what he's doing. Um, so you know that to me all fits in really nicely. So I, I I quite like that. I think it's just too much of being captured then escaping and being captured and, and then escaping. So you know that that to me is probably the. the the weakest part of this story is is that but you know lots to love um i can't go without mentioning the the ogron deity or monster that horrible blobby thing that appears at the end i know they they desperately tried to to reduce how much time it was in the story but you know ogrons these you know fearless mercenaries are scared of this weird blob I think he looks all right, though. I've often, I've often been it's confused by people saying he doesn't look very good and we had to cut it back to say it wasn't 
I think it actually looks quite good. It looks quite convincing. It literally just appears at the the top of the sort of ridge, doesn't it? And they've got their mural, haven't they? Mural, yeah. Their mural to to, to light candles to and stuff. (laughs) It's it's Um, very very odd. Very odd. It's not as odd a design, I think, as um, Bless when the Doctor has his mind probe session. And, and, and oh, yeah. you know, this isn't misogynistic, but the lady doing it looks like she's, 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 she's like doing a beauty contest. And she's got the, the gloves and the hair. And she's like, <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, basically rip out your mind to find out what's going on. It's like, it's like, why is she a prison officer? Why isn't she sort of looking a bit kind of like, you know what I mean? It's a very strangely glamorous sort of get up for someone that's interrogating a, a, but it's an not, international it's criminal. Like- it's like, go ahead, go on. It's just like, um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. But um, I'm not sure there's, there's an awful lot I would add to my views on frontier. I do. I don't think it's as bad as I sometimes think it is. Um, mm. And I like, and I actually, the, the funny thing I was thinking is, you can completely see the world of Moonbase Three that follow. You can see, you can see where. Barry and Terrence thought, ah, this, this, this sort of setup works. And we'll, we'll make a series out of this, which we may or may not enjoy. <laughs> um, yes, he said. Maybe we'll, do a, maybe we'll do a review for Moonbase 3 if we can cope. <laughs> oh, my Lord. That would be quite the thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so, no, I like, and I think it's a very instant setup. And I, 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 you know, I really like the guard costumes. I, I I think I'd cosplay that. That's my cosplay for the week. Yeah. <laughs> the hat, the there's, there's loads of like icons and sort of badges and stuff. You can see, you know, people on Redbubble going mad over the time, like, the images and the emblems on different uniforms and ships. Um, also, great to see Ray Lonnon talking of guard costumes. Um, sadly, sort of underused, I think. Could have had a bit more of him in that. Um, but it does feel a bit of a, a bit of a, a slow bubble and then a rush job, and I think yeah. that's that's the, the my 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 upset on it really. Yeah, definitely got some pacing issues there. I think. Um, but great. I mean, I love all the stuff on the South Bank. I love the look that. I mean, South Bank mm. looks alien and 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 that. It looks great. I mean, as we said before, the Draconians are an incredible. It's it's almost a bit bizarre that the Draconians didn't come back. Yeah, I, again, I, I agree with that. I think I was, I've, I've said this a couple of times. There are some there are some aliens that I think have been a wasted opportunity, and the Draconians I think could really have come back and been a, a great adversary for for John or for Tom again uh, as we roll further along. Because it's obviously noted in the story that the Doctor's met the Draconians before and he's helped them out beat, beating a space plague. So you know, it's if as only as there was have... some sort of serial where loads of aliens and Doctors came back. Oh, was there? I wonder which one that Were was. The Draconians not in that one. Wasn't there's there a Draconian? No, there's no Draconian Doctor Who in the dimensions of time. I believe there are some BBBs, maybe. The 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 Keith Barnfather's done some dramas. I think with Draconians. Then I could be wrong in saying that. I think he has. I think Sophie's in them. But hmm. actually, back to Doctor Who. I, I, it is it is remarkable that it, it didn't come back. Yeah, I mean, I suppose hmm. it's sort of about that cusp, isn't it? If they didn't come back in the last part, we. Uh, they weren't going to come back in the Tom and then could have been in the 20th anniversary series, maybe. I don't know. It just it, it is it is odd, mm. especially as they were so well realized and they looked so good. It just seemed a bit of a an unusual it, thing to not. It was have one it. of Pertwee's favourites, wasn't it? He loved the, the costume for the Draconians. Less so the Daleks. Mm. So are we cruising? Are we like like battle cruising? <laughs> to a score on Doctor Who and the Space War. Yeah, yeah. They look, no more facts there, no more facts down south. Uh, just that they're the same Daleks from Day of the Daleks, they were recycled for, for that last scene and for the next one. And Michael Wisher played the Doctor Dalek voice when he was using the hypno thing against the Ogron. But no, that was, that was all I had. You really are full of stats today, aren't you? It's overflowing with stats. Right, 
Let's 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 go to Jason for his score on the space war then, and his prescripted surmising. Well, I wouldn't say this is prescripted. Uh, I would say that uh, you know, again, I, I've said a couple of times now. I think season ten is a good season. There are some good stories. There are some not so good stories. This is uh, definitely again not one of the worst, not one of the best. I think it suffers a little bit with pacing, as I think we've, we've, we've noted a couple of times. Um, I love the Draconians. Uh, actually, kind of, kind of, obviously, the, the Roger Delgado is our story, so you know, it's going to have a place in my heart. And I think Joe gets some great, um, some great stuff to, uh, or Katie gets some great stuff to get her teeth into. So all round in this, in this story, um, I'm going to pop the uh, Space War, or... Uh, frontier in space at a very simple seven. Simple seven. Good. And James, where are you at on the space wall? So um, it takes a while to get going. A bit like Jason. And uh, then a very quick end. So uh... <laughs> just like Jason. Rude. Rude. <laughs> But I, I like this story for the fact that it you get to see, you know, the th the three main cast there, and the interaction together is beautiful. And if it, you know, if, if this was written as the last episode, yes, I'd change the 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 ending for Delgado. But I love the fact that he gets these scenes with with Katie and with John. So for me, it is a seven and a half. Seven and a half. Mm. Okay, well, we're like we're like a sort of um, battling defibrillator. Here. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I think it's slightly below par. I mean, there's lots of great things in it, but it's not as good as the Three Doctors, but it's still great, and I still actually do enjoy a lot of it. So I have given it six and a half. We're so close, you can feel our firepower here. Um, that gives. <laughs> Frontier in space, twenty-one points. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so, well, we're at the halfway point, just over the halfway point. Um, so, our current leader is the Three Doctors on twenty-four, and Carnival and Frontier both have twenty-one. Ooh, it's tense. Ooh, well, we've got two stories left to go. Um, so, join us for part two. <laughs> <laughs>